Today on The Topping Show, Donald Trump is indicted, Matt Walsh cancels his show due to threats, Bed Bath & Beyond may go bankrupt if they can't sell $300 million of stock, Virgin Orbit goes belly up, hackers pwn a Tesla Model 3, Disney layoffs their Marvel chairman, Elon Musk now the most followed person on Twitter, QAnon released from jail, and Hyundai and Kia vehicles continue to be stolen. All of that and much, much more on The Topping Show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Today's episode of The Topping Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN and Topping Technologies. ExpressVPN helps protect your online data, and Topping Technologies is an IT value-added resource and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. If you're an IT leader or business owner, give us a little assistance. You reach them at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Now, going to the business part of the podcast, Bed Bath Beyond recently announced that they will most likely have to file for bankruptcy if they cannot sell $300 million worth in stock. They are currently being publicly traded for about $0.53 cents per share, and it fluctuates dramatically throughout the day. So who knows what it will be by the time this is published a couple hours from now. Now, they're in deep, deep trouble, especially on the New York Stock Exchange. So if a stock falls below $1, Red flags already start going up and scrutiny increases and they might even be at risk for delisting. Now, specifically on the New York Stock Exchange, they note that if the publicly traded stock falls below a dollar for more than 30 days, the New York Stock Exchange will threaten to delist to them because it falls into a, viol a violation of their minimum pricing regulations. And after 30 days of receiving that warning, they have 10 additional days to tell the New York Stock Exchange how they're going to fix the situation. So, needless to say, they're in a sticky situation. Their stores are making less of sales. The stock is going down. So they desperately need a cash infusion. And if everyone goes out and buys the stock, that would give them a little bit more time maybe to restructure the company or readjust their whole plan. But they're in a tight spot. So I don't know how many people are going to buy it unless you have a similar meme stock like GameStop situation where there's a lot of people shorting the stock of Bed Bath Beyond, then they might jump in to try to offset that because you have that situation with GameStop where I think it was around like $4 a share. It was really low. Everyone, all the short sellers, they started buying it and it went up to over $400 a share. It was a extremely interesting, fascinating outlier in fiscal history. It'll be interesting to see it plays out again. Now going on to Virgin Orbit, we reported on them a couple weeks back talking about the difficulty of that company and whole business model. They're a spinoff of Richard Branch's parent company for his space exploration. Now, Virgin Orbit was an interesting idea where instead of having a traditional space shuttle go up straight for satellite deployments, they actually retrofitted almost like a MacGyver situation, a Boeing, I think it was a 747. But basically, think of a commercial airliner they added additional bells and whistles to it so they could fly a little bit higher. And then from there, they would shoot the actual satellite from it or off of it. It's an interesting idea, but they had a lot of technical difficulties and you have other competition that has us. They already have a proof of concept that's been proven. It's beyond proof of concept. SpaceX is already doing this profitably. Now, Virgin Orbit failed to secure additional funding that they needed to stay afloat. They will cease operations, quote unquote, for the foreseeable future, according to CEO Dan Hart, and they will lay off all but 100 of their employees. And a good thing for the, thankfully, those employees who are being let go, they are going to have a complete severance package for every employee leaving, including a cash payment, benefits, as well as assistance finding a new role, which is one of those also debatable things where should that money be the business beyond a reasonable doubt or it's statistically looking at the odds it's going to go under completely. I don't know how much those last hundred employees will be able to fend off the inevitable perhaps, but you are moving resources around and that's taking resources away from the business. So it's good for those employees leaving, but it could also be the nail in the coffin depending on what that amount is. Nevertheless, it's sad to see another company most likely bite the dust. Going on to interesting other business news, hackers pwn a Tesla Model 3 in less than two minutes, which is pretty dang impressive from a cybersecurity perspective, especially fascinating. Now, Tesla 
Tesla has a long standing history of inviting ethical hackers to break into their vehicles in exchange for a re reward. They usually will send their Teslas to all these hacking conventions where it's a really great opportunity for them to basically go up the best of the best. And there's incentives to actually find the holes or the vulnerabilities in the security before the bad guys can in the real world. Now, this occurrence happened at a convention called Pwn to Own. And if you search it, you, yeah, search engines, search engines these days should be smart enough to get it, but it's PWN, the number two, then own, where a fresh group of hackers won. Now each group only had 10 minutes per, to perform the hacks. The first prize won $100,000 as well as a Tesla Model 3. The second, or I should say first prize, as a first reward, the second more advanced attack against the Tesla won $250,000, and I believe they also got a Tesla as well. Now, they specifically hacked into the head unit, which is behind the operations of the infotainment and the navigation. So it wasn't a situation similar to years back when some engineers from Wired.com or Wired Magazine actually hacked into, I believe it was a Jeep, Jeep Compass SUV when it was on the highway, and they were able to remotely take over the controls of the vehicle, including the acceleration, the braking, and the steering, where they were able to actually take the vehicle, steer it to the shoulder of the highway, and turn it off completely. However, still a pretty big security vulnerability considering if you have the access to their map technology and their navigation, considering how dependent people are these days on technology for the actually getting places, that could be a pretty sophisticated malicious attack, just rerouting someone to a inappropriate location, or maybe if it's a security threat, rerouting them to be attacked. There's a lot of people who do not know how to read a physical map these days, yet alone, I don't even know if gas stations sell them, maybe, but that could be a serious threat. So it's good that they were find, able to find that. And you see a lot of tech companies embracing this type of methodology where they're embracing the hacking community, reaching out to ethical hacker, hackers and, and giving them rewards so that they can know where the vulnerabilities are and they can fix them before malicious actors actually execute those types of plans. So the most successful companies, tech, tech, tech companies, as well as other traditional companies, are starting to get into this more and more. There's a lot of famous stories you hear about Microsoft hiring kids out of high school just because they were able to break into an Xbox or they able to find a security vulnerability that no one else thought about. So the more unique perspectives, the better. That's why my team is always looking for additional talent. You know, if you know anyone in cybersecurity, we're always growing. Sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Now, going on to other interesting business news, Disney is laying off Marvel's, Marvel's former CEO as well as chairman. Ike Perlmutter was the Marvel chairman of the company for about, been in the company for about 30 years. He was the CEO when Disney bought Marvel for $4 billion back in 2009. Like a lot of leaders, it sounds like his involvement had dwindled throughout the years as with company absorptions. There's a lot of crossover responsibilities. Now, his involvement in Marvel movies ended in about 2015, according to the crew, and Marvel TV by 2019, which begs the question, who the heck watches Marvel TV? I had to search that on the internet. I never even heard of Marvel TV before. I guess there are people who still own TVs. Or maybe it's on a streaming service. Nevertheless, I, that's, I didn't know they did that. And, of course, there's also some controversies around Ike. He was... The first one I don't think is that bad in terms of he's very price conscious. Which, if you look at a lot of the leaders throughout pretty much every business history, a lot of them are pretty frugal just because they know every penny you save can be put back into the company and reinvested. Either R&D, marketing, advertising, employees... What have you? I mean, Sam Walton, all the, all the best. Many of them have that characteristic, so I'm not too surprised that it's an issue. Now there are some funny stories. Now, there's instances of him actually taking paper clips out of the trash to reuse, which is somewhat hilarious. I, I didn't take the time, but it would be fascinating to see if just go on the internet, see how much a box of staples cost, or sorry, paper clips. I have heard people trying to reuse staples. It doesn't really work, but. You'd be surprised what people do. Now, all you have to do is take the cost of the box of paper clips and then find out what the cost per unit is. And then what's your time worth to bend over, sift through the trash, and pick it back out? I mean, there used to be a joke about Bill Gates. If you ever came across a, a quarter in the road, it wasn't worth his time to just bend over and pick it up because he makes so much money. He would literally lose money investing that as opposed to just checking his phone or you know talking to his advisors or buying new stocks, what have you. So 
this might one of those this might be one of those things where maybe just sends a message to the staff that that's his mentality that they're gonna make every penny count which if you look at marvel's history they kind of had to they were extremely close to the bank of bankruptcy in the past before these blockbuster movies came out they were very desperate that's why they sold intellectual property to fox i believe that's how fox actually got the intellectual property of x-men back in the day because marvel was up against the wall physically speaking now another interesting thing is he actually suggested they use potato chips as a food item for movie premieres in order to cut cost which is kind of funny when you just think of the movie premieres in general is basically it's a party to have people excited about the film to incentivize them to give good reviews in that situation you might want to go overboard although debatably i'll you almost say that'd be an unfair influence on their of their view of the film by giving them so many benefits like that now he also allegedly bribed a new york police department to accelerate renewing his gun license which I wouldn't be too surprised considering it's New York and there are many instances, unfortunately, of civ citizens not getting the right to bear arms in New York where you kind of had to know someone or money got passed along. Other states, they actually have, there are a couple instances of concealed carry where you have shall issue versus must issue, constitutional carry. It's a whole fascinating subject in and of itself. Layman's terms, some states make it prohibitively hard so that only politicians and people of influence actually get their paperwork approved. And I won't say which senator, but there were a couple where they got their, they were very anti-gun, but ironically they got their concealed permits immediately approved. And you have stories of regular civilians, they do an application, it's been 12 months, they, get enough, they never get word back. Now, this cost cutting and laying off Ike is also coming off the trend of Disney continuing to cut costs, and, and they plan for 2023 to just lay off about 7,000 employees. So streamlining the Marvel department, as well as it's kind of diminishing returns. Ant-Man did not do as good as all the other blockbusters, which historically they've basically been billion-dollar productions, really fiscally successful. It'd be interesting to see if they try to turn that trend around. Now going on to the culture part of the podcast, Elon Musk is now Twitter's top follower. Or followees whatever now in layman's terms as of thursday morning elon has 133.088 million followers on the platform now granted he could just have all of them i'm actually surprised just as a little tongue-in-cheek he just doesn't make following him a default when you sign up for twitter kind of reminiscent to myspace back in the day where everyone had tom as a friend which is almost like a hilarious little inside joke now, since most people don't even remember MySpace, unfortunately. It was one of the most successful, I think it was actually the first big social media company people think of. Then Facebook immediately eclipsed that idea, and now they're the dominant platform. Nevertheless, he's overtaking Obama, who had 133.02 million followers on Twitter. And Twitter has slowly been making a turnaround when he joined when he actually bought twitter they had an annual burn rate of 1.5 billion dollars just constantly bleeding money so he has some cut some costs but it's interesting to see with all the quote unquote controversy and i use that in air quotes because most of it i think is just personal tax based on his philosophies and ideals but even with all the negative press about him he's still increasing twitter followers so that's interesting now, other interesting cultural news, Matt Walsh cancels his event after him and his family received multiple death threats. He is a daily podcast producer, podcaster, and he grew to prominence, especially because of his tongue-in-cheek documentary called What is a Woman, where he just goes around the United States asking people what is their definition of woman. He actually goes to Africa as well to further prove his perspective. Now, he was scheduled to speak at Washington and Lee University. Now, unfortunately, he canceled that, and quote-unquote from Matt, he said, quote, Sadly, I have to postpone my speech at Washington and Lee University due to threats to my family and other serious security concerns in Nashville this week. I cannot leave my family and fly to another state. I hate to push this event off, but my wife and kids come first. Unquote. Matt also said, additionally, quote, The threats to my family only make my me more determined to fight this evil, I will not let any harm come to my children or my wife, and I will not let these psychopaths scare me into silence 
neither of those things will ever happen, I promise you, unquote. So he is absolutely an outlier in the cultural lexicon of not backing down from physical or he receives countless online threats and harassments, of course. But you have to somewhat respect his muster because in the world of acquiescence and people backing down from fights, he's standing up for what he believes him. And very few people are willing to do that these days. And no matter what your ideals or philosophies are, I think everyone should have that right to express their opinions. It's sad to see some people don't share that American value anymore, but I'm of the old school philosophy where I may not agree with what you have to, the right to say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. Which is why I pretty much allow all comments on my YouTube channels. Not that there's a lot of comments, but if you post a comment, I'll read it. And most, more often than not, when I schedule permits, I'll actually respond to it. Even if I don't agree with your perspective, I always appreciate additional data and additional perspectives. It makes life a little bit more interesting. Now, going on to the main complex story of the day. I say complex because there are a lot of variables in this story, and I scratched the surface and did as much research as I could, and I'm constantly learning about the intricacies of politics, as well as governance, as well as court proceedings, etc. Now, Trump has officially been indicted by a Manhattan grand jury. This is fascinating. It's the first time a former president has faced, faced criminal charges. This stems from the case in which a $130,000 payment was paid was made to an adult film burnt out star. Uh, oh, yeah, I said that right. Stormy Daniels during the end of the 2016 presidential campaign. Allegedly, Daniels claims that she slept with Trump back in 2006. Trump, of course, denies it. Trump classified his reimburse, reimbursement as a payout of the payout as a legal expense. The exact charge against Trump is un, is still being brought to light since indictments are usually filled with the court under seal after a grand jury vote in New York. Trump stated, quote, this is a political prosecution and electric interference at the highest level in history, unquote. And Trump also claimed, quote, the Democrats have lied, cheated, and stolen in their obsession with, with, with try to, quote, get Trump, unquote. But now they've done the unthinkable, indicting a completely innocent person in an act of blatant election interference, unquote. So a quote within a quote. Now a key witness is gonna be Michael Cohen, who is, Mike, who is Trump's former lawyer and fixer. In 2008, Michael Cohen did plead guilty in federal court to making an illegal payment to Daniels for, quote, principal purpose of influencing, unquote, 2016 election, and he claimed he did it on the behest of Trump. Trump recently acknowledged he repaid Cohen 130K. However, Trump insists the payment was legal. Trump emphasized that the money did not, quote, not from the campaign, unquote, and that the deal had been, quote, a private contract between two parties known as a non-disclosure or an NDA. Now, normal charge is falsification of business records, which would be a misdemeanor. It becomes a felony if done with the intent to violate, violate a different crime. And some say that Bragg is trumping up the charges, pun moderately intended. And this is the first instance that this has happened. Now, how it happened, a grand jury was made up of 23 people and in this instance, you only need a majority in order to, for the indictment to go through. So you only needed 12 people. You don't need a unanimous vote like in an actual traditional trial. Now, this is one of those things where it is moderately interesting to see both sides. I'm sure there's a fancier term for throwing shade or pretending like their side is almighty because this is not the first time there's been murkiness around federal election commissions and campaign finance law. Far from it. It's disgusting that there's allegations and actually proven cases on both sides of the aisle of this happening. Now, historically, the last highest paid fee was a few years back when Obama paid $375,000 to the Federal Election Commission. And that was the largest fine in history where a couple of donations were made to his campaign close to the election date and they didn't disclose where they came from. And you also had Hillary Clinton pay $113,000 to the Federal Commission when she covered up her payment to for the Steele dossier, which kicked off the Russian conspiracy theory or the Russia witch hunt, whatever you want to call that situation. And this is the first instance where you have a politician actually being arrested and actually being tried. Historically, it would seem that Trump, they would just slap a fine on this and move forward. I think that's 
the big difference people are starting to notice in this particular case thus far. And of course, more facts might come to light that we don't know of today. It's a very fluid situation. It'll be fascinating to see how it progresses. Now, some are saying Trump could be ar arrested as earlier next week. Allegedly, the Secret Service said they declined for a movement of Trump this Friday, or today rather, for the actual arrest. Now, there could be some truth in that, especially if you look at any historical presidential move, fiscal or movements around the country, there's no such thing as random or spontaneous. Because of the security involved, famously, when Clinton actually visited McDonald's, they do this to try to appear more human and kind of relate to the voters, make it look like a spontaneous visit. It's not because of security procedure. They have to plan these things weeks out in advance to make sure they check every nook and cranny and ensure that they could safely provide transportation for one of the most... I don't know, it's a fancy word of saying, one of the most absolutely security vulnerable persons on the planet. Of all the security, the president gets the most because there's the most threats made against him. So I'm not surprised that a day after this indictment goes through, the Secret Service is saying, yeah, we're not going to do this on Friday. They're, if he actually does get arrested, they're going to need some time to actually prep a physical transportation and let the proceedings uh, underway. And it is interesting to see, and I always tell people, Look at multiple views of every situation, as well as look at the different media outlets. If you go to Fox News for this situation, you of course they're going to say Trump is 100 percent. Layman's say they're going to say Trump is innocent, a witch hunt, and go to MSNBC. They're going to say he's a devil. It's always look at what they're saying. So I actually looked at CNN because I want to see what everyone is thinking. And even during their panel discussion, where they had a couple, about five folks talking about the situation. They're admitting that the odds of Trump of getting convicted were very small, and a lot of them are saying that the charges are a little bit boasted, and it's going to be hard to prove he did this, but how did he prove it? His it was his intent to break another law, which is, it seems to my understanding that's kind of what the situation is hinging on, and this also might backfire. So it's a really interesting situation, just like when the FBI raided his home in Mar-a-Lago to get the secret documents or the. They actually ended up backfiring because Trump made it over a little bit like $1.3 million campaigning off of that instance. And it really reinvigorated his base and supporters because they saw the federal government doing something that was an outlier. They haven't done that to other people, well, historically speaking, but they're going after Trump in this very unique way. So it actually shifted public opinion a little bit. And I don't think that's what political powers want. A lot of people want Trump to run because they think they can beat him in terms of the left perspective. If you watch a lot of the talk shows like on CNN, MSNBC, even even people on The View are saying they would much rather have Trump because they think he's easier to defeat than DeSantis in a election. So it'll be interesting to see if this situation of arresting Trump, and according to the charges, it looks like there is a case, it might be a small one, but the fact that they're going after the president for the first time and not just slapping him with a fine I mean, he'll allegedly get a perp walk in handcuffs. He'll get a mug shot. And it might be one of the things where people on the left and the right think they're going to gain a lot of political points using those images and using the, this situation as actually campaign fodder or campaign ammo or whatever metaphor you want to use for campaign materials. So this whole situation might, it might benefit both sides. It might blow up. He, there's a small chance he might go to jail. It'll be interesting to see how this occurs. It certainly seems to undermine some people's faith in the whole court system since it's the first time they're going after a president. But then others people are saying, are advocating the position, saying this is justice. In the end, maybe it'll just further entrench people in the sides they already have. So it'll be interesting to see how the situation progresses. Now, other interesting political news, QAnon, Shaman, Shamanon, something I barely, I had to do a lot of research because I, I only knew a little bit about the situation. So he was recently released from jail thanks to Tucker Carlson, who's a reporter on, famously, a reporter on Fox News. Now, you know, may know the QAnon shaman is a guy that had the funny buffalo hat into the, he went into the Capitol on January 6th. Now, his actual name is Jacob Chansley. He was released 14 months early thanks to Tucker Carlson releasing the video on January 6th, which showed that Jacob was peacefully ex escorted throughout the Senate by the actual police when the materials that we were shown and that pretty much every channel showed on the mainstream media at the time 
was that it was a violent insurrection and people were forcing their way into the Capitol and breaking down doors, breaking down barriers. From these video clips that we're seeing, he was actually very calmly and peacefully escorted throughout the whole building and the police actually encouraged him to take pictures. It was, it was a stark contrast to the data we were given at the time. And this is also something where I always wonder when both the Democrats and Republicans really team up on something or they both have the same opinion, because very rarely do they team up for our benefit. Now, House Speaker was uh, Kevin McCarthy. He was actually the one who released all the footage to Tucker, and a lot of the Republicans were against him doing that, and many Democrats were as well, which I always wonder, why trust... Why do you trust people who want to limit your access to data? I want all the data so I can make up a fair and informed opinion, which is why I look at multiple news outlets and multiple perspectives. And in this situation, people were against that idea, which, especially if you're being charged by the federal government, that seems disgusting that they would withhold data that could, in this case, prove your innocence. Now, he was originally in, he was in jail for 27 months, and he actually pled down, and he was released uh from a 41 month sentence. He served 11 months in solitary confinement. And it sounds like he has a case to sue the federal government if they're withholding data that could make him, prove him innocent. They threw him in solitary confinement for 11 months. Now, he was pleading guilty to entering the Capitol on the charges and a lot of people are saying he should be sued for wrongful uh, prosecution. Now, some department just some say the Department of Justice is releasing Jacob in an attempt to move the move the point of habeas corpus, which have which would have exposed that they violated his civil rights by withholding Brady material. Going back in time in history classes, I actually don't know if they still teach this in history. They should, but habeas corpus. If you look up the definition of the law, it is a writ requiring a person under arrest to be brought to before a judge or into a court, especially to secure the person's release unless the grounds are shown for their detention. So it was a long time before they were able to see their day in court, and it sounds like they just put their case down. So it sounds like a serious miscarriage of mis uh, judge, a serious miscarriage of justice. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. If other people who are also turned out to be wrongfully prosecuted, if they sue the federal government, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Now, going into the business blunder of the day, by bar none, I mean it's going to be Kia and Hyundai with their fiscal with their actual security vulnerabilities now a growing trend on tiktok is again great very intellectual platform you'll see the best of humanity on tiktok now there's a growing trend on tiktok which is hot wiring kia and hyundai's because they're so easy to hot wire and for the folks at home who don't know kia and hyundai have many for many years have been the same business entity so that's why they share a lot of the same parts including their security parts now all the users need is a USB drive and a screwdriver, thanks to a glitch that makes it easier to bypass the anti-theft mechanisms. Specifically, New York Police Department Commissioner Kishnet said that he noticed the city had a spike in Hyundai Kia thefts. Back in September, there was an average of 10 to 12 Hyundai Kias stolen per month of 2022, but by December, the number grew to an average of 100 vehicles stolen in the month of December. And all the, many of those occurring in the Bronx, upper and upper Manhattan. It's just one of those things where every company, no matter if you're making a car or a supercomputer or an app, or even if you're a manufacturer of widgets in the middle of Omaha, you really do have to have a security first initiative because there's so many malicious actors out there. And there are actually, because of this instance, there are some insurance companies that are drastically increasing the rates or even not covering those vehicle models anymore because they're so easy to steal. So this is having a huge ripple effect on all the owners of these vehicles. And of course, automotive industry is eyeing the situation and everyone of course is increasing their security. Kind of going back to the article we said earlier where Tesla is actually incentivizing hackers to find those vulnerabilities first before they're executed in the real world. But to have something that is such a simple thing to bypass and break into the Hyundai Kia, I mean, that is certainly the business blunder of the day. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. Cannot thank you enough for like, share, and commenting on the videos. It really helps the channel out. Don't forget, tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone to stay safe and fight the good fight.